That's how I feel sometimes, folks. You know, aren't turning loose and letting go. And let, I feel like, I, well, I guess I got to turn it up a little bit. You know, we'll just we'll just sit here and let it churn. I'll just keep digging until it breaks loose. Well, Lord, help me. That's wonderful. We had a wonderful time Sunday, and I am thankful. I am thankful the pastors uh, responded in our area so well. I believe in this apostolic message. I'm a one God apostolic to my core. Amen. I am not afraid. Praise God. I'm not afraid to share this gospel with anyone. I'm not afraid to worship with others who believe this message but may have differing, differing opinions on other areas. Amen. Amen. I will allow them to be wrong and pray for revelation. Some of y'all caught that. And if I'm wrong, God give me revelation. But I feel like I, I, I want to be balanced in the word, but I, I'm, I'm confident in who I am in the Lord, that I'm not afraid to worship with others, amen, who don't exactly see it the way I do, because I'm not going to change. I'm going to pray God work on them. And I felt that happen Sunday. I felt we made an impact on some other apostolics in our area. Praise God. In fact, they enjoyed it so much, they, they, uh, they want to come back again. You know what that tells me? That they see Peace Tabernacle as a place where we can be unified with believers of like faith. And I pray for their churches. I want them to have apostolic revival. I want the Holy Ghost to be poured out upon their people. I want their churches to grow in truth and righteousness and hope. Amen. And I believe that when we pray for others to receive it, God pours it out upon us. Amen. Now, I, I'm thankful for the Vision 7 services. Thankful for everyone that participated. Thankful for everyone who did something. For everyone that said they would be a director, even though they didn't ask to be. Pastor told them to be. They stood. They stepped up. Every service was impactful. And uh, hopefully before Sunday, I will be able to see how many uh, visitors we had. I know in just one service alone, we had over 22 first-time visitors in one of our services. And so, and there was other services, things, uh, you know, were happening so fast, we really didn't be able to keep, keep a good count. But we're going to do our best to try to see how many was impacted. And then, of course, this past Sunday, there was... I know 212 adults that were counted. Is, huh? Total of 215. But that didn't include small children, did it? Did y'all get to catch all the small children? Okay, because you know the small children, it's hard. They're in between the pews and around the pews. So we probably had anywhere, well, we know we had 215, but there was probably about 230. That's not including everybody out in the hallways. and You know, I don't know. But there was well over 200 here. And then on our, our baby dedication day, we had 236. Now, I'm thinking about having a baby dedication day. <laughs> People were getting caught up on their baby dedication. But, uh, in fact, I, I went to a uh, uh, men's conference, and one of the pastor friends, because, see, they sent out an email all over the district telling the whole district about what, what happened on our baby dedication day. And so now when my pastor friends see me, they're like, well, there's that baby dedicating man right there, you know. Hey, if it reaches souls and they'll come to the house of God, I'll dedicate babies every Sunday. I'm about reaching souls. Amen. I am about souls. I'm about unity of the brethren. Amen. You know, men, men often want to quote Hebrews, uh, I believe it's uh, 12 and 14 or 14 and 12. You know, they like to say, without holiness. I mean, people like that scripture. They just misquote it, though. They want to quote the second half of the verse. But the first portion of that verse says, follow peace with all men. So the first preface that Paul gives us in Hebrews, because I think he's the writer of the Hebrew, amen, states is you got to be peaceful with all men 
Amen. I was talking to a pastor friend today, and some accusations were made, and uh, he was wanting to retaliate and make. I said, "Won't you? Won't you just follow peace with all men? Let's let's follow Hebrews the twelve and fourteen, or fourteen and twelve. I can't remember which one it is. Twelve and fourteen. See, I got it right the first time. Thank you, Lord, for memory. And then, without holiness. So first of all, you got to have peace with your brother. Second of all, you got to have holiness. Without these two, you will not be able to see the Lord. So you can have all the holiness you want, but if you don't have peace with your brother or peace with your sister, that ain't even what I'm going to teach on tonight, but that's just a good word. But I do believe that tonight. Amen. And I'm thankful for that today. I'm going to bring a, a need to the church. I'm not asking. I just want to let you know about it. Uh, you don't have to do anything about it. If you'd like to do something about it, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Brother Victor Alba. How many love Brother Alba? Brother Alba lost his grandmother day before yesterday. And now he's having to travel to California. It was an unexpected expense. He's going to have to fly out there. Um, and uh, I just felt a need to try to help him in that. Uh, his plane ticket's around $900. I'm not saying we're going to do the whole plane ticket. But if you feel led in any way, uh, I'm going to try to give uh, to that need. I'm going to try to give $100 or so. Um, if you feel a need, to, uh, a desire to help give to that, would you just give that to Sister Valerie and let her know, Sister Valerie, uh, we want to help Brother Alba. And then I'll ask her, Sister Valerie, did anyone uh, offer to help Brother Alba? And if she says, yes, this is what was given, then that's what I'll send to Brother Alba. Is that all right? Amen. I know we love him around here. He ain't been here in a while. He's been traveling and busy, and we've been busy. But uh, I do believe that men of God need our help. You know, evangelists, they travel, and, and they give everything they have. And, uh, you know, you don't realize it, but when you see him pull up in that expedition, that's his house. So you can say, boy, that's a nice expedition. Well, if that's all you had to live in, I'd want it to be as nice as possible, too. And I promise you, I have seen them pull up. And my sister, she is a, uh, a master at packing. And they have a storage up in Conroe. And, uh, of course, it's in an air-conditioned building. But it, I've watched them at springtime go in. They'll get their spring and summer clothes. And then they come in the fall, and they'll get their fall and winter clothes. And they transition out. And, uh, I, I, and I know they're not the only ones that do that. There's lots of evangelists, amen, that... Uh, do that now let me just say in that regards we've had some wonderful services brother david walker will be with us on the last sunday of this month amen it's a fifth sunday service amen we will only have the one service don't get spoiled to that but it is a uh, a fifth sunday and it's also memorial day weekend so i was able to knock both those out this year without having to do two weekends in a row so uh let me just say it to you like this when you give Remember that we've had some short services this month, and we do need your help to pay the light bills and things that we do. Amen? Praise God. And as far as our building repair goes, um, I was not pushing it till this past weekend. I was keeping check on it, and board members were keeping check on me. Oh, how I love them. And, uh, you know, uh, the gentleman, he made a comment, and, and I'm thankful for people in our church who are educated on things and know people. Because I was able to respond and actually help our loan officer learn how to do their job. And uh, thanks for Sister Brandy for helping me do that. And uh, isn't it great to know somebody in the banking business? And I got an email today that said, because uh, we were needing an appraisal on our land. He said, the appraisal's good. We should know something in a week. And I'll keep you posted. So now he's responding to me. I was having to ask him, ask him. But now he's getting on board and saying, okay, I need to keep him informed. So we should know something in the week, and once we uh, get everything lined out, amen, we will be repairing the roof and the building and the walls on the building for sure um, and uh, try to stop some of the leakage. Like right over there, I don't know where it comes from, but it comes out of that air-conditioned vent. You don't even see it, but I do. And uh, we've got leaks in the hallway, leaks in other parts of the building. And uh, I'm not complaining. This building has been very faithful to this church. It's just time to fix it up. Amen? So... All of that is happening. If you have any questions, you can come see me afterwards. Somebody say, praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, the second chapter, the 41st verse. 
I bring you greetings today from Pastor Orland McLean. I went today, and he turned 48 years old yesterday, and I went up and had lunch with him today, and uh, he greets you in Jesus' name, and uh, told me to tell you he always has had a special place in his heart for Peace Tabernacle. I know y'all had some wonderful revivals with Pastor Orland McLean. Amen. He's still a fireball. Amen. Still got them big old hands. You get around him very long, he's poking all over you. I love him. Acts 2, 41 and 42. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight for your word. Anoint these lips of clay once again. Anoint our ears to hear. Bring understanding to our mind that we might grow closer to you. And we'll do this in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. Brother Manuel, I want to say it was so good to see you marching tonight, sir. Amen. I'm thankful God is answering prayers and working through whatever means he's working. I am thankful tonight to see Brother Manuel moving. And you should rejoice too. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So what I'm going to bring to the church tonight, you're going to get a little taste of what uh, our Purpose Institute uh, students get. Now, Purpose Institute is a localized Bible college, if, if you will. They offer associate's degrees in theology and bachelor's degrees in theology. And if you ever would desire to be partake, partake of that, it's once a month on a Saturday. Our campus is in Edna. Your pastor is one of the instructors, Brother Williams, Brother Kite. Uh, all these men are instructors. Brother Griffin from Columbus and... Uh, and it's been very beneficial to a lot of people. And so you can actually learn a lot. Now, I, I have uh, uh, recently started teaching with them. And, and my session for this last semester, and I'm not going to teach because there are four lessons that I taught. But uh, I, I thought it was a good subject and one that to bring to the church. And the importance of the apostolic doctrine. And I do believe that doctrine is fundamental for the church today. I believe doctrine must be taught. Doctrine must be loved. And doctrine must be practiced. Amen. And you know. Doctrine. Is a principle. Or body of principles. Presented for acceptance or belief. As by a religious, political, scientific or philosophical group. It is their dogma. It is their rule or principle of law, especially when it's established by precedent. It is something that has been taught and learned and kept. That is doctrine. We're living in a day and age where, amen, the, the church world that we live in, religiosity, if you will, amen, you know, everything has gone light. Everything has gone diet. Diet Coke. Diet Pepsi. Huh? Even in our alcoholic beverages, everything's a light. But you know, uh, we can't have a light version of the Word of God. When preachers are nothing more than self-help, When going to church is nothing more than going to a concert with a positive message at the end to make you feel good about yourself. See, I, I, I honestly believe that the preaching of the Word of God is what saves the saints of God. I don't believe that you pray through one time and that is it. I don't believe in eternal security. I believe that the preaching of the Word of God keeps us saved. The teaching of the Word of God gives us knowledge, gives us understanding, but it is the preaching of the Word of God that causes me as a believer to find again, once again, the place of repentance where I may get right with God on a daily, weekly basis. 
Amen. We don't need to have a light version of the church. Praise God. Amen. I, I, you know, being type 2 diabetic and, and having to watch what I eat, and I thank God that my blood sugar, amen, has been staying down around 100. Amen. I'm going to rejoice in that. I, I accept that as God's will. Amen. Because that's pretty good. You know? And uh, is that pretty good, Sister Carlicia? Is that, is that permissible? Amen. Well, the other day it was 80. And I said, come on, let's go get some ice cream. But you know what I've learned? Now, sister, well, don't look at me like that, Sister Waddy. It was good. But I've learned this. I can eat a little slice of pie instead of the whole pie. Brother Alba told you the story about when I got home, my mama said, that's your chocolate pie. I did not share one morsel, not one crumb, not one scratch with him. That was my pie. And I ate every bit of it. Then I found out I was. Anyway, now I try. You know, and then for a while there, you know, well, if, I'm, if this is what I am, I guess I better do sugar-free. Well, sugar-free is just as bad as sugar. And I won't go into all the things that's bad about it, but there's bad things about it. And I've learned this, that uh, carbs, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you all lessons on diabetes. Carbs is what you got to look for. I, I was looking at things that were supposed to be sugar-free, good for me, and uh, I looked at the carb count. Well, the doctor said anything that's a carb is a sugar. And so, you know, I learned this. It's about moderation of intake. Now, you may not get excited about getting a kitty cone full of ice cream, but I get excited about a kitty cone full of ice cream because it's just enough. You learn when to eat and when not to eat. After 7 o'clock, it's not good for me to have carbs. And I've learned if I don't eat after carbs after 7 o'clock, then the next morning my blood sugar is right where it should be. But when I'm really active in the middle of the day, eat that little carb and it'll burn up real quick. And what I'm saying all that is to say this, is that the doctors or others would say, substitute, use this fake. Because, it, but it will still affect you in a negative way. I would rather eat the real thing in small quantities and enjoy it versus eating something that's fake. Amen. Now, I don't drink any kind of Cokes, and I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that's something that I, it was easy for me to give up. Because I used to drink Dr. Peppers three and four at a time, root beer. And I was a Mountain Dew junkie. The original energy drink. Mountain Dew. I didn't drink coffee. I'd go into work and I'd have me a Mountain Dew. Because our machine at the, at the job was free. You know, you get your free drinks. You know, as long as you don't waste it and didn't. So, I, I didn't drink coffee. I drank my Mountain Dew. And uh, didn't think nothing about it. Till things happen. And so they said, well, you can drink diet. Well, diet's nasty. I'm just going to be truthful. I don't know why people drink Diet Coke. That's nasty. They tried to fix it all up. Coke Zero. I tried Coke Zero. It's nasty. It ain't like nothing. Because there's nothing like the real thing, baby. <laughs> That's right. And I, when you say, why, why are you going through all these? Because I'm trying to paint a picture for you tonight about doctrine. About doctrine. We need substance in our living for God. The world is constantly trying to bring you a substitute to, for something that is real. Amen. I heard something today that uh, just kind of blew my mind that, uh, you know, even in corn products that we eat, that they have genetically modified them so much that once they grow, and if you tried to plant the seed of corn that, that would come from a, a corn stalk, if you tried to plant that, it would, it would grow a stalk, but it won't produce a plant. And that just blows my mind that corn really isn't corn anymore. We're, we're trying to take, uh, you know, everything and modify it and, 
And uh, somebody the other day, I, I went out to the farm and picked some, some dewberries off the vine. And they're like, well, are they organic? Because there's lots of folks getting all caught up in the organic. Because they want the real thing. We're tired of the fake. I said, there ain't no more organic than this. They're off a fence line. <laughs> I crawled through a ditch to get to them. I was watching for snakes. I had my 380 on my hip. <laughs> And old Sister Bumgarner, she was enjoying it. But you know what? In this day and age, if we're not careful, you know, the world wants to substitute substance for filler. I mean, a chicken nugget isn't really chicken. Now, they may taste good, but they're really not chicken. And if you can go to churches... And they can be hip. They can play the latest hit songs from the Christian radio. You can go to churches and they, you can be cool. And the preacher dressed in the latest style. And wear a t-shirt. Wear their Nikes. Know the latest slang. And tell you... You're a victorious overcomer. What are we doing? We are dumbing down the church. I mean, think about it. If you went to the doctor and you walked in the doctor's office and he came in and he was in pair of a, a pair of tight skinny jeans. Yo, man, I'm looking at your child here, bro. And I just want you to know that there's some hope for you. I'm going to be in the surgery with you tomorrow. I'm going to be in this tight shirt showing off my pecs and my guns. Yeah, you going to let that guy touch you? You see all them sharp objects? I'm going to cut on you tomorrow with them. Word. See, I went back to the 80s there. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know about you, but if he came in acting like that, I'd be like, where's the door? <laughs> you will not be seeing me tomorrow. <laughs> Your presentation has killed everything. And yet, we want individuals like that to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to us. People have tried to casualize. I'm going to tell you something. I got scripture for, for those that say, well, you know, you, the Lord just wants you to come as you are. You study the word of God. They could not go to the temple until they had been purified. They couldn't go to the temple, amen, if some things were out of order. They couldn't go to the temple if they weren't dressed right. If you came in there with a certain something out of order, the man standing at the gate would say, you can't come in the temple today. You're not worshiping God here because you're not right. Amen. And so this modern day and age, doctrine, amen, there really is no doctrine. What's your doctrine of salvation? Just believe. That's not a doctrine because the devil believes. So is your, is your doctrine like the devil's? Because the devil believes and trembles. But do you have a doctrine of salvation? Do you have a doctrine of holiness? Do you have a doctrine of the oneness of God? You begin to talk to those who, who say they are Trinitarians, and you get to talking to them, and, 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 and they get confused because they really believe the oneness of God. Doctrine is important. And I don't want a light version of doctrine. I don't want a watered-down version of doctrine. I don't want church just to be something we come to and go through the motions. Amen. I do want you to cry tears of repentance. 
I do want you to go to an altar and say, God, even though I've been in this church 30 years, uh, I know that I'm still made of flesh. Uh, I know that I still have insig- you know, things in me that need to be worked on. Work on me, Jesus. I don't want a preacher to come in here and tickle our ears. I don't want it <coughs> to just be easy believism. As long as this pastor's got breath in his body, amen, it ain't going to be no sugar-coated preaching around here. Amen. But they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Steadfastly means unmovable. Amen. Steadfastly means uh, that when others started saying, well, what about this and what about that? Uh, They said, no, this is the doctrine. We're going to hold to it. It is what the Lord gave to us. 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving to them, which believe and know the truth. That scripture's been fulfilled. Because if I wanted to be a priest, I couldn't marry. So think about. It. And if you ladies wanted to serve in the church as a as a nun, you couldn't marry. That's a doctrine that they teach. The scripture tells about it. But it's wrong. First Timothy 4 and 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that, they, that thy property may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Doctrine is important. Second Timothy 4 and 1. I charge ye therefore before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from truth. And shall be turned on to fables. If there's anything our church needs to take a stand for today. It is the doctrines of the word of God. If there's anything Peace Tabernacle needs to be known for. Is is that is a solid apostolic doctrinal church. They believe the truth. They still believe salvation is repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. They still believe that there. They still believe in holiness of the outward dress. They still believe that men should dress like men and ladies should dress like ladies. Amen. They believe, amen, that a woman shouldn't dress like a man and a man shouldn't dress like a lady. Well, glory to God. We got to take a stand for our doctrines today. Amen. Doctrine is our foundation. Elder Howard Goss, who was the former general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International, once stated, from the standpoint of religion, more than anything else, people would rally behind or pledge their allegiance to primarily three things. Personality, organization and doctrine we find this to be true
We find this to be true. We can think of the, the, uh, our, our current presidential race. And people, amen, they're promoting themselves. What draws people to candidates? Personality. Organization. But what really gets people's attention is their message. That is their doctrine. And the thing that is proven to have the greatest potential of holding the loyalty of followers is their message, their doctrine. Why is this? Doctrine or the message is the basis or foundation for how one lives or conducts their life. So we listen to somebody's message. And if it agrees with what we believe in, then we support that individual. We're loyal to that individual. And that is why the doctrine from the Word of God, you don't have to be loyal to me as a pastor, although I appreciate it when you are. Amen. You don't have to be loyal to my personality. Amen. Or this organization, the United Pentecostal Church International. But the doctrine of the Word of God, that is where our loyalty should lie. As long as you, preacher, are lining up with the book, I can be loyal to you. As long as you, United Pentecostal Church International, line up with the doctrine, we will be faithful to you. Because first and foremost, we are loyal to to the message. We are loyal to the Word of God. So if organization goes a different direction, then we will go a different direction. Why? Because we want to stay true to the doctrine of the Word of God. If somebody who's a personality, a man, woman, or child, amen, preachers fall all the time, amen, if they go a different direction, I'm going to love them, but I'm going to stay true to the doctrine. There are those who have left us because they no longer believe the doctrine. There are those who have left us because they said it's not essential to be baptized in Jesus' name. There are those who have left us who said it's not essential, amen, to have a separation from the world, even though the Word of God teaches that. Amen. Doctrine is a set of belief that governs a person's life, not personality, not organization. You should not do what you do. You should not live how you live based off of somebody's personality or some organizational stand. Hello. I'm thankful for the United Pentecostal Church International. I am thankful for the stand that it has had for a long time. And my prayer is that it will keep holding on to the things that it has stood for in times past and not change. However, if it should change, I'm going to stand with the doctrines of the Word of God. Amen. What you live in your house, amen, should be based off of what you have been taught by the Word of God. Your house should be a reflection of the Word of God that you have been taught and what you have put on on the inside of you amen somebody says well you just live that way because the preacher says to do it that is legalism now i respect those amen who submit to what their pastor teaches even though they don't understand and believe me if i teach something and you don't understand come to me let's have a bible study I will do all I can to get it to you so you can understand it. Amen? And yet God honors those who honor those that teach the Word and you live it. That is the difference in living for God now versus 30, 40 years ago. Nowadays, every, every, people question it. Well, why this? Well, why that? Well, I just don't believe that. Well, why? Well, why? Tell me, Pastor. Why? 
And that's good for the preacher because that makes a study. You've got to have an answer. But when I was growing up, if pastor says, we're not going there, nobody said, why? We had a godly fear. We were afraid if we said, why, God might strike us. And what the first thing people have lost is a godly respect for the house of God and the man of God. Well, you may agree or disagree, but that's truth. Amen. Psalms 11 and 3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Righteousness is dependent upon a true foundation. And a church that has no doctrine has no foundation. You can label yourself a church. And in this day and age, everything's a church. We got the one, two, three church. We got I'm going upward church. We got the down and out church. We got the get down with it church. We got churches called the uprising, the revolution. Sounds more like a club you'd go to than a church. And that's the problem is we're creating a club atmosphere instead of a godly atmosphere. And the reason that's happening is because they're not building churches on doctrinal base. Amen. They're doing it on an entertainment base. We don't have sanctuaries of worship. We have theater presentations. We don't have worship with musicians. We have concerts that you go to every week. Amen. The difference between what was happening here around here Sunday, amen, and, and versus, uh, you know, what happens in a lot of other places was there was participation. God wants participators, not just observers, because we're not here to entertain you. But, oh, he rejoices when people praise him. Amen. You cannot begin with a false premise and ever hope to reach a proper conclusion. Because when you do this thing, amen, you don't really touch people's lives. You don't change them. But I want a church that can change me. I want preaching that will change me. I want a service that will change me. I'm thankful that in my life, I've gone to some church services, amen, where the power of God was so strong that it was life-changing. Amen. When I walked in there, I was loaded with heaviness, and I was loaded with discouragement, and I was loaded down with a lot of stuff. But when God came down and touched me, my life was changed. And the truth is, everybody practices some type of doctrine. Whether there's true doctrine or false doctrine. And yet the thing is, is this. If a church is not built on the apostles' doctrine, it is a false doctrine. Because the apostles' doctrine is the truth or foundation for everything that is eternal. Because the Word of God is the basis for all truth. The Word of God. Now let's go a little further. I'm, I'm trying to hurry along. Luke 24 and 44 says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written by the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understandings that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise 
of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So the Lord gave them, opened up their understandings so that they could understand, amen, the Old Testament scriptures better than any human beings ever had. He gave them revelation of the Word of God. He put doctrine into them. And so when the Bible tells us that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, then we know that what the apostles taught was truth. And we cannot err from it. And those that say, well, I want the, the doctrine of Jesus. Jesus, amen, if you go back, you say, well, what about when Jesus talked to them in Luke 24 and 44? Jesus told them what he wanted them to preach. Jesus gave to them the doctrine. He told them, amen, to preach in his name that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Amen. So that, that people say, well, I want Jesus' doctrine. Take them to Luke, the 24th chapter, and the 44th through 49th verse, and say, well, Jesus told them this is what I want. And if you've not been baptized in his name, then you're not fulfilling his doctrine. I love hanging around Brother Joe Rodriguez, Brother Jay. You ever heard him witness to somebody? Especially those that are Baptist. Or, uh, he'll say, well, how were you baptized? Oh, fa baptized, Father, Son. Well, you're just a Catholic. I ain't no Catholic. Yeah, you are. Because of your doctrine. Because anybody that baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost in those titles and does not speak the name of Jesus, you are nothing more than a glorified Catholic. See, the problem with Martin Luther was he got some revelation. He got the revelation that Jesus paid it all because he, he didn't have to do penance as, as a priest. He didn't have to live by their, their false doctrine. He just needed to keep going. He stopped too soon. He took some truth with him, but he didn't get all truth. Because if you're going to live in a doctrine of, of truth today, amen, you got to have all the doctrine. And anyone that baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, they're just glorified Catholics. And you say, well, they shout and speak in tongues. Big deal. There's Catholics who do that. There's charismatic Catholics. Although, I heard one man, Johnny James, you know, says, don't call them charismatic. Charismatic means gifted. They're just flat sinners. <laughs> mm. So, when you look at it that way, it brings a whole new, new light to things. But you know, the truth is this. We have to be true with the Word of God to ourselves. People say, well, all y'all do is just, y'all just hammer repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, infilling of the Holy Ghost. That's right. We understand that that's the foundational doctrine of salvation. That doesn't guarantee your salvation but my, that's the, that's the door. That choir sang it on Sunday. Amen. You can't go over. You can't go under. You can't go around. You must go through the door. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to the Father unless you go through Jesus Christ. That's why the... The, the, the doctrine of the Godhead is so important. And the oneness of God is so important. 
God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But to get to the spirit, you got to go through the door. You understand? The door. He hung on the cross. Amen. Now, we often misquote a scripture, and I've been just as guilty as anybody. Amen. But I do know that if we draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to us. But a lot of people say, you know, you know, the Bible says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And we use that to say, come on, let's lift the Lord up. Well, you've got to understand the true uh, rendering of that scripture. What he was saying there is that if I be lifted up, I will draw both past, present, and future. If I be lifted up, that's the power of the cross. That was the power of Calvary because he was lifted up. He could now draw all men unto him. And so what I'm telling you today is that's the power, amen, of that scripture, that he is the door. He's the doorway to the spirit. For the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. So to get to the spirit of God, you had to go through the body. Well, how do you do that? Baptism in Jesus' name. Well, glory. I'm, those are doctrinal things that manifest themselves so that we might be saved. So, yes, we will preach and teach. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It doesn't matter if it's 2016. Or 34 B.C. A.D. He's still the same. You see, we need our doctrine. The apostles were of God. The hearing, to hear the teachings of the apostles was equal to hearing God. The apostles had been independently trained by the Lord. I was talking to someone today about a great teacher who I will have come through here, Brother Kelsey Griffin. And you know, he's a, he was an elder in my life, a mentor in Bible college. Amen. I mean, he, 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 he can get down on it. He can teach to the nth degree. And uh, I was saying, you know, man, one time when I was in Alice, Texas, little home missionary, building a small little church, had 25, 30 people. We was digging it out, trying to get after it, and just doing the work for it. He, 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 he just... He said, well, I'm just driving through. Nobody just drives through Alice, Texas. Alice, Texas is in the middle of nowhere. They call it the hub of the oil field for a reason. It's in the middle of a nowhere where all that oil field is, and you can go. <laughs> City of about 20,000. I mean, their, their high school mascot's a coyote. Think about it. The Alice Coyotes. There's a reason why the coyotes are mascot. There ain't nothing out there. Amen. I, I got introduced to a lot of South Texas agriculture and animals in, in, in Alice, Texas. I learned what a mesquite tree was. I mean, they love mesquite trees down there. It brings shade. That's all they got. It's pretty rough down there. So he wasn't just passing through. He was checking on one of his students. That's kind of man he was. He had an old travel trailer. He said, well, I just want to stick around. He said, I'm studying the El Camino Real. He said, I'm doing some historical study. And so he, he said, can I, you want me to preach for you while you're here? Absolutely. Since you just happen to wander through here, since you're going to your next destination, just wander, won't you stay and preach for two weeks? I don't have nothing to pay you. I ain't come here for pay. I come here to do some study. I'm doing some historical study. And one Monday, he said, well, today I'm going to do my historical study. Brother Griffin, can I travel with you? Come on. And for that whole day, someone that I used to have to share him with everybody else, I got all to myself. Now, we, would, we traveled up Highway 281, and we traveled up 59, and we stopped at all these historical markers, and he had a notebook, and he was writing down notes. And, and uh, while, while he was studying the El Camino Reel, amen, I was asking him questions. 
And we was talking about the things of God. And he was giving me insight. And then we'd get to the next historical thing. And he would tell me, you know, here's so-and-so. You know, this is what happened. Then we went to Goliad. One of the best experiences of my life was getting to explore Goliad with Brother Griffin. Because not only does he study the Word of God, he studied all this history. And so it was like sitting with a master teacher teaching you all about the things that happened at Goliad. Not just one side, but both sides. Because he had done this exhaustive study. Then we drive through Refugio and Refugio. And we drive down to a certain tree. And he's like, pulls underneath this tree. And he said, this is where such and such general stopped and held his troops. If he would have not held his troops underneath this tree, Santa Ana would have been overwhelmed because he would have gone up to, or, 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 or Sam Houston would have been overwhelmed because he would have been there to reinforce Santa Ana. But because he held his troops here, under this tree, and I'm thinking, I'm standing somewhere, which I'm sure they had modified it because the highway's on both sides. And you can see it to this day as you're going, out, going towards Corpus Christi. There's a big tree. And there's a historical marker. And we just traveled together. And it was like I had all of this insight. And that's the way it was for the disciples. Jesus would teach to the masses. I told all that just to tell this. Jesus would teach to the masses. And he would feed the masses and feed the masses. And then he and the disciples would get away. And for a long time, amen, those apostles in him would be one-on-one. -on -one. Amen. It's like, now, what questions do you have? Who knows all the things that he taught them privately one-on-one? -on -one? But we see those things Exonor, you know, it brought to life, amen, when they begin to write, when they begin to preach, when they begin to teach. And so through the apostles' doctrines, we get the revelation of what they received one-on-one. -on -one. And so without a shadow of a doubt, and I'm not going to go any further. I've got more notes. Maybe we'll, we'll pick this up in a few weeks. We've got lots going on in the weeks to come. But... The apostles' doctrine is our foundation. Somebody says, well, I want Jesus' doctrine. That's not what the Bible tells us to continue steadfastly in. The Word of God says, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And when we live, that's why we call ourselves apostolic. There's two things that we identify with. Apostolic and Pentecostal. We're not trying to put down anybody else. I don't even really consider that denomination. The world likes to classify us as something. But we're Pentecostal because we trace our roots back to the day of Pentecost. When the church was born. The church was born at the day of Pentecost. Before Pentecost there was no church. But the day the fire fell, the Holy Ghost fell. Amen. That day where there 3,000 souls added to the 120 that were in the upper room and the church was established in Jerusalem. And then throughout the scripture, where does it go next? Then it's in Judea. Then where does it go? Samaria. See, the Lord, he's a God of order. He gives it to the Jews, both in Jerusalem, Israel, Judea. Samaria, half Jews, half Gentiles. Then he gives it to Cornelius' house. The Gentiles. Perfect order. Even in the word of God, that's how he, he, he establishes. First, I'm going to my house, Jerusalem. Then I'm going to Judea, which is the other portion of my house. Then I'm going to Samaria because they're half my house and half the Gentiles. And then I'm going to the Gentiles because I've been grooming this man who's been faithful. He's building up a monument to me, a memorial. And I'm going to pour my spirit. God already knew who he was going to fill with the Holy Ghost. I believe that. But it is up for us. Because there have been many the Lord has filled with the power of his presence that are no longer walking. What keeps us saved? I'm going to end with this question. What, what saves you is not the experience of the Holy Ghost. Hello. What, what, keeps you, what saves you, what is going to save you and get you to heaven 
is not just being able to come up here to the altar, shed some tears, and speak in tongues. Because there's lots of people that come up here, weep and cry, speak in tongues. But if you go back out in the world and you're just like the world, I'm thankful you're getting a good touch from the Lord, but you need to get some doctrine in your soul. Because doctrine is what you live. And doctrine is what's going to save you. Amen. Because when, Sister Waddy, when I haven't been feeling the, the Holy Ghost, when I haven't always felt like shouting, I lived by what I knew, that He is faithful to do. Amen. When I didn't feel like running the aisles, He was still faithful and I stood on what I knew to be right. Amen. I was talking to someone today and speaking of my life experience. And he said, you know, in that circumstance, either you leave the church and backslide through bitterness. Or you stay true, find somebody to submit yourself to and get stronger. Well, the thing is, is this. I thank God for a good taproot. Huh? Huh? Because that old root that was started when I was born and brought up in this apostolic faith was a lot deeper. Even though the storm of life was trying to tear it away, it was what I knew that kept me going to church when I didn't feel like going to church. It was what I knew to be truth. Hallelujah! That when I couldn't pray, I kept going back to the altar. When I didn't feel the Spirit, it kept me worshiping. When I didn't feel like dancing, I danced anyway. When I didn't feel like shouting, I shouted anyway. Now, I know that's going to cross some of y'all's theology. But there were times I shouted and didn't feel like shouting. There's times I was up moving to the music when I didn't feel like it. But I understood there's a doctrine of worship. Come before his presence with singing. Huh? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Amen. I've got more scriptures for dancing and singing and worshiping in the house of God than you had reason to do it when you was out in the world. And I'm not even talking about just being in the Spirit. Because David wasn't in the Spirit. He was in the doctrine of worship. Now we need to make sure we understand there's a doctrine of worship. We don't preach on it all often a lot. When we talk to the church about worshiping. Come on church, you got to praise God. You got to praise, come on church, praise God. But there is a doctrine to that. It has its root in the Old Testament. And when we apply it, our services break wide open. You think about that. When we apply the doctrines of worship, God moves. And basically, that one scripture, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That whole scripture there is, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his mind. Hello? Well, glory. I better quit. It's 9.05. Thank you for coming tonight. But we need doctrine in our life to keep us saved. Why people fall short of salvation is because they stop believing the doctrines. And one thing you will hear somebody say, well, I just don't believe that anymore. What they're saying is, I don't believe that doctrine anymore applies to my salvation. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Lord Jesus, we understand.